My name is Rich Schmidt. It's November 13th, 2017. I'm here at Linfield College with Tim Hanai. And Tim, our first question for you today is why wine? Why wine? Well, when I was young, a long time ago, it's 1966, my dad was the uh, administrative director for the um, Dade County Medical Association in Miami. He was into wine, red burgundies, Pinot Noir, how apropos, <laughs> and I liked it. <laughs> and um, uh, this was also before wine was e anywhere nearly as fashionable and whatever it is today. So he was a member of the Schender Rodisseurs uh, and the Physicians Wine Guild, and, and I'd, I saw there was something about the ceremony and, and all this kind of stuff. So uh, they thought it was kind of precocious when a 14-year-old started drinking wine and reading wine books. So I have, this year will, will be my 51st year of, of a passion for learning and reading. And uh, it, it's very interesting also, what, what really set me off, and I've been talking about this with Greg Jones and it's all the work I do, um, I also have an advantage of knowing what one wine was like in the 60s and before. Because wine back then was so much less expensive, it was so much available and there was so, so little of our preoccupation with disenfranchising and sneering at people and embarrassing them for their preferences. So it didn't matter if you were drinking sangria or, or Grand Cru Burgundies or Great Bordeaux or whatever, wine was just kind of a, a beverage. Uh, some people took it very seriously, but nobody made fun of people who didn't, which it's not that way anymore. So. Um, when I started reading the wine books, I was actually uh, sharing with, with, with Greg um, one of the seminal books I read. It was called The, the Food of France by Waverly Root. And uh, the premise of it was breaking down the regions of France, the culinary gastronomic regions, by the type of fat that was used. And so if lard was the fat, you had pigs, you had geese, you had cabbage, you were in the mountains, you had sauerkraut, you had all these commonalities, even if you were on opposite sides of the country. In the Pyrenees, the cuisine was very, very similar, much more similar to the, to the Alps than it would be to local lowlands. If olive oil was the fat, you'd have Mediterranean climate, you'd have garlic, you would have saffron. There would all be these associations given by that climate and that type of fat. If you had butter, you then had cheese, you had beef and veal, you had much more arable land, so you had cultivation, you had cream and fat and all these kind of things. And so I, I just got struck, and then the history and the traditions, then the geography and the geology, and then fermentation science. It's like, so it's this endless playground for intellectual curiosity, for exploration, and even better for food. <laughs> so, <laughs> sure. so it was my interest in wine that then led to an interest in gastronomy. And my first career was actually as a chef because I was starting, uh, at, I was too young to drink. And uh, um, so I, uh, I dropped out of college and started uh, uh, serving my culinary apprenticeships. And, and I worked 10 years professionally up to an executive chef with a real, real passion for, for French gastronomy and traditions. And then wine was always my avocation along with my primary and interest in gastronomy. And then um, that all kicked over about 1979. I went into the wine, but I became a wine buyer. And then, it, then that was like game over. Geek with a culinary background. Sure. So, yeah. How do you think your culinary background has influenced that perspective on wine? Two ways. Uh, at one point in my career, I was heralded as the wine and food pairing guru. And this was from very famous people in the wine industry and uh, uh, so forth. Because I, I talked 
the talk, I walked the walk, I read the books. Mm -hmm. um, right now I'm trying to eliminate wine and food pairing. It has no basis. None of the traditions that we're talking, oh, this goes with this because of that, none of it's true, none of it. Oh, the red wine with the red meats, this natural thing, it isn't. It actually, I can show you categorically deconstruct that everything that it's just a bunch of pseudoscience and fertilizer. Interesting. Okay. And and it's in in the wine industry's out of control. It's just totally so caught up in its own fertilizer that we don't know what the truth is anymore. And so this this has kind of put me out in left field a little bit. And um, and it but it's led to what I do today, which is actually focusing on people's individual perception, their sense of value, their aesthetics. Mm -hmm. And nowhere in the world is anyone teaching or researching actually what drives people to like what they like with wine. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got all these prescriptions and metaphors about wine and food pairing, none of which are true. And so I'm here to disrupt that. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So how did you come up with your Venotype concept? Well, let me ask you, Rich. <laughs> what wines do you love? Uh, I find myself usually liking rosé or uh, sometimes like a Pinot Gris. I'm still kind of working my way up towards Pinot Noir. Awesome. That's absolutely, you like salt? I do. A little bit more than most? Probably. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> Actually, I, I know so many things about you already. You like sweet wines, don't you? I do. And you love Moscato, I'll bet. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. You need to know that all of these things I've asked you so far mean you have more taste buds than most men, especially. You live in a higher, higher perceptive world. And the reason you're working your way up is because it's work. It's not naturally, the, the dry wines are not in your wheelhouse naturally. You're part of probably 30 to 40 percent of the Caucasian population, and of that, 30 percent are men that live in this spectrum of incredible sensory cacophony and sensitivities. The reason when you have coffee, you put cream and sugar in it, or maybe even prefer tea, is because of the sensitivity to bitterness that most people don't get. So that's what's driving reference to, to, to rosé and that you can tolerate, but your heart is really, you love sweet wines. Now 50 to 70 percent of Asians are genetically programmed the way you are. And because of the way the government got, uh, took on um, uh, promoting red wine uh, for economic reasons, the, uh, the background of, on wine in China is uh, the government was trying to reclaim a lot of the grain and the rice that was going into beer and uh, in something called Mao Tai Mo -tai and whatever. So they were actually trying to find alternatives agriculturally that would grow in areas that were normally not very cultivatable. And uh, and these are this is what's going on. I mean, this is the cool stuff about wine. So here's here's how I got to Venotypes. Um, uh, uh, in 1990, Joel Butler and I became the first two Americans in history to pass the Master of Wine exam. So, you know, I know you probably have that in your notes, so we'll all get us there. I failed the exam examination miserably in 1989, and I signed up for a writing course to help me write the theory papers and construct better arguments and essays. So in 19, early 1990, I showed up at a writing seminar and I had signed up for the wrong program. And I was in a class with 80 electrical engineers for three days talking about critical thinking and disruptive innovation. The poster child for this was the clock on a VCR as evidence of a failure of the electronics industry to provide a useful product to consumers. And in millions of homes was a flashing reminder of this little blinking light, you're too stupid to use me, <laughs> seriously. And 
And in this three days, for me, I was doing wine communication exercises in, in areas of my expertise and focal vocabulary. Everybody wanted to be my partner because they're all a bunch of electrical engineers. I was the wine guy. But it, it hit me that something was really wrong with our language, with these endless arguments over what's the right alcohol level or sweetness or wine and food pairing and whatever. So what happened for me was a shift in trying to position myself as the end all be all and then to go, wait a minute, what about you? And that's how I can have this conversation with you is critically rethinking everything I've ever been taught, but also using my wonderful, passionate knowledge about cuisine and wine and gastronomy and wine sciences to actually hold up a hand and say, hey, you guys, we need to hit reset here. We've become so immersed in metaphors and misrepresentation of history and the truth that we need a do-over here and we need to actually look at consumers and so that led me to researching perception sciences. What I've been able to learn and I've got mentors and research colleagues all over the world in all sorts of areas and it's just so cool. We thought okay so you know that some people need glasses and other people don't. You've heard of color blindness. So there are physiological genetic variables that dictate what we perceive or not and at what intensity. So this is genetics, these are genomics and there's genetic SNPs, the single nucleotide polymorphisms responsible for who you are, the color of your hair, the size of your feet, your whether you're male or female, et cetera, et cetera. So no, no argument, right? Well, what we don't know is some people have 500 taste buds, other people have 11,000. That's a big difference. Sure. Some people have receptors for a much wider spectrum of color or frequency range of sound, sensitivity to touch and to light. And there are huge differences in the range of what we are capable of experiencing and the intensity to which we experience it. So that's genetics. A phenotype looks at the genetic or origin of an organism and then how it adapts and mutates over time and, and you can even see these changes for example, you've got a bunch of tree frogs that live in, in the rainforest in the trees. And they're green and shiny and they've got a certain diet and they do certain things. And a group of them go into a cave and say, oh, this is, this is kind of nice. And it's, you know, they uh, start eating the bugs. They're, they're different, but you know, that'll work. And they decide to hang out and mess around a little bit and they have little frogs. And they decide they never need to leave the cave. And then over a period of time, they lose the color, they lose their eyesight, they've got a whole new diet. And you, if you look at the two frogs, you can't even imagine, but this is a new phenotype because it's mutated. <laughs> so we've got this crazy notion that, oh, your palate matures is whatever, and that's what you're working to do. But it's not, it's not natural for you, it's a mutation. Now, it doesn't mean you shouldn't do it but it's going to be harder for you because of your genetics and the, the way you experience alcohol and bitterness and so on. So you're going to try to adapt and change over time to become less natural. And it's not your palate maturing, it's neuroplasticity that's reorganizing your values, watching the peers, learning the language. Totally nor normal phenomenon. The wine industry lives by this absolute untruth Oh, your palate matures. No, it doesn't. Your changes are neurological, not genetic or physiological. That's what the heck I do. <laughs> <laughs> and so how long did it take you to come up with this, refine it, to define it? Um, 
it's hopefully it's going to outlive me because it's just my life has become oh, oh we really need to look behind this door <laughs> okay let's figure there's a puzzle it's like like playing an old video game with with uh, uh, Indiana Jones oh finally ah uh, oh no <laughs> ten more doors sure <laughs> you know sure. so um, this so we're we're now almost thirty years down the road um, and. Every day, every day we have new conversations. My primary research colleague is a pediatrician at Cornell University. She looks at children's behaviors and personality traits, learning abilities and, and cog cognitive skills in relationship to the exact thing I'm studying with wine. So I will we'll get back to you in just a second because I just knowing what I've asked you so far, I know so many things, hopefully I'm gonna scare you. And we spent two hours on my trip up, driving back from Napa yesterday, we spent two hours discussing the, the possible role of actual, the, the physiological molecular element of something called sensory adaptation, which is things happen with wine and food but it's not what we're telling, it's, it, it's not what anybody's looking at, and, it, and it's predictable, and it's based on your own your venotype, what happens. So we're looking at what can we discern is either happening at a molecular or a receptor physiological level, and then what's happening in the neural capacities and benchmarking and whatever. So sensory adaptation is what happens with wine and food, and if you have sweet food, it makes your wine suck. If you brush teeth, you know what happens when you drink orange juice. And literally, it's the same thing. So sensory adaptation is where one set of uh, uh, sensations will slightly or dramatically alter another set of sensations to increase or decrease that sensation. And so we know what happens with brush teeth, drink orange juice. And it happens, so, oh, try the cherries with the peanut. The duck has cherries, and Pinot Noir smells like cherries, so it's a good combination. Cherries make wine suck. They do. Now, the fun thing, and you do this, you're going to love this, and this is why you love salt. Take a Pinot Noir, taste it. You're getting more bitterness. You're getting more sourness. You're probably, uh, it's, it's probably impossible for you to like scotch. It just burns and hurts too much, all right? So you've got uh, a known genetic variation of SNPs for alcohol warming. You've got two incidences, and it hurts way more than it does for other people. You love salt because salt suppresses bitterness. So I want you to take a, a wine. If you have something sweet like a grape or a cherry, sip the wine, eat the grape or the cherry, sip the wine, and, and, and you literally it's not nice. Put some salt and lemon on your hand or on somebody's neck or <laughs> you've done this before. Take a sip of the wine, yell, ay, 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 ay. Lick your hand, try the wine, and you'll, and you'll literally go, wow, smooth as can be. If you get a beef steak in Tuscany, it's a heavily salted porterhouse steak served with lemon. If you have anything in Alsace, France, it's vinegar, it's salt, it's choucroute, sauerkraut, it's cured meats. When they cook trout, they actually, it's got to be so fresh that it still has that mucus. That's why when you're trout fishing, you have to wet your hand. And, and they plunge it into vinegar bouillon, and it's called Tuita Bleu, one of the great specialties. And it's actually cooked in vinegar, salt, and water. And so all the cuisines of Europe actually evolved so that wine would be good with them. And that's what I'm promoting is a return to the actual culinary and gastronomic traditions of Europe that actually create food that's good with wine. And then if you are having a Bistecca alle Fiorentina with Moscato, you're going to love it. And you're going to love it more than forcing yourself to have a Cabernet. Now, with the salt and the lemon, you might find the Pinot Noir starts to come in the realm of possibility as long as we can suppress that bitterness for you. So, were you a picky eater? Mm -hmm. Yeah.
And then um, do you have to do you still cut tags out of your clothes or find things irritate your skin? Sometimes, yeah. 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 And you're really picky about sheets and pillowcases. And probably if your clothes get washed in the wrong detergent and or fabric softener, you got to rewash them because you can't even wear them. Probably, yeah. 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 Got it. Now, how's your mom? She's good. Good. And I would, I would bet you hard money, 10 to 1, seriously, I got, I got 10 bucks if you got a buck, that she had moderate to severe morning sickness with you. I actually don't know. Can you call her? <laughs> I could, but I'm not going to. Okay. No. <laughs> right. Call her after this and find out. Okay. I will. And, and the relationship is that when you've got a hypersensitive genetic being, the fetus, in the mothership, the mothership has to adapt to the sensitivities of the fetus. And, that, and they also have much different nutritional requirements and needs, and, and, uh, and especially for electrolytes and so on. So ice cream and dill pickles and those kind of things. And the morning sickness is the fetus telling the mothership, no, we're not gonna, this ain't gonna work, get rid of that, let's try something else. And that's the morning sickness. <laughs> How about that? It's pretty wonderful. Yeah. It really is. You're, and and I, I, I hate to say it, but you already know it. You love people, and you are empathetic to a fault. You trust people too much. Do you have any rescue pets? I do. I many. Know it. Yeah. <laughs> and were you ever a pickle juice drinker? No. Okay. There's a big, big group of people out there like you millions of people who actually drink pickle juice and it also is one of the best ways to replenish electrolytes. I've heard that. Yeah, and that's why the dill pickle with ice cream and the mother and the salty sour thing going on and whatever. This is this is such a blast. The history of wine is not what people are being taught in wine education programs. It is so vastly different than anything that we're teaching or telling people. So my mission in life is to restore intimacy between people and the, and the love and caring and love of hospitality. And what's happening is wine people are getting more and more dug in. If you don't like this, something's wrong with you. It's, uh, you should learn to appreciate it. And we're talking in tongues. We're talking in this descriptive metaphorical language that is complete crap. Oh, you do, 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 do. and then we start matching metaphors. Well, do, 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 do. so it would go with this recipe because the because the here to here to here is in the recipe here. So the here to here, and then in uh, the neurological look that we're taking, uh, there's uh, Dr. George Lakoff at Berkeley University, and his proposition is that a metaphor is actually a physical connection in your brain that overrides reality. Wine and food people, especially the more they become trained, the more passionate they become, are more and more isolated from reality. They're not tasting anymore. They're not actually smelling anymore. And they'll argue this till the cows come home, but it's really, really true. And their wine and food metaphors have no basis in actual reality. So there's this growing disconnect of wine and loving people. It's becoming more and more unfriendly in wine education and wine and food pairing creates inhospitality. It creates a complete removal so people can't get you and say, hey, I'm an expert. I know wines all around the world that you are going to love. And if you ever feel like going this direction, let me show you some things that'll consistently make that a better experience and then over time, you can form your own metaphors and create your own reality wherever you want to go. And I love you for it. I already like you, Rich. Because I actually know the kind of human being are, you are, the empathy that you have. And it's also why you guys are doing what you're both doing. And that's because you want to communicate, you want to share with others. So we find that the venotypes, so there's four basic venotypes, tolerant, almost exclusively genetically men, uh, live in a very diminished sensory capacity. Uh, they see less colors, they're more, more likely to be colorblind. They hear less of an audible spectrum at a lower intensity, so they have to turn up the volume and whatever. They need the lights brighter, they want the thermostat colder, and, and uh, they typically do not have the genetic warming SNP 
so alcohol tastes sweet. They love Robert Parker wines, they love high alcohol wines, and they want more, 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 and they tend to be very financially successful. They're bottom line oriented, they're linear thinkers, they move their hand like this explaining things <laughs> to show me the bottom line. The next group of people is what we call the sensitive venotype, and this is about 35%, a little bit uh, more male than female. Um, it's people who can tolerate a lot of the strong flavors and so on, but they're also a little bit more sensitive, so they, they usually tend to be, I can have white wine or red. They're very context driven, and they're very indecisive. Because they like so many things, they, they need something to help filter, it. oh, it's summer, I want a summer wine, because I need something to help me make a decision. Uh, in families, they are the, the, the one in the middle trying to Sep separate the arguing parties. They tend to grow up as great managers. They have great people skills. Uh, they make wonderful people in human resources and so forth. And they're also very often great teachers. Um, hypersensitive and sensitive, hypersensitive and sweet venotypes are about 50% of the Caucasian population and have very, very similar uh, sensitivity traits and again, you know, there's gradations. Um, the hypersensitive simply wants, or th at least says they want dry wines, but they're most typically the people who talk dry and drink sweet. So they want to be told it's dry, but they actually want it sweet. And this drives wine experts crazy because they like Naomi Pinot Noir, but they also love dry Riesling and a lot of, a, a lot of uh, lesser intensity, lower alcohol wines. And then the sweet, that's about 25% of the population, and the sweet venotypes is about 25%. Actually bigger, because a lot of the hypersensitives are lying about their preferences, just like you were lying to me a minute ago. Because I asked you what wines you love, and you're trying to like those wines, the wine you really like are sweet wines, so you're one of them. And uh, they tend to be picked on from childhood for their behaviors. Rich. Pay a little more attention in class. You sit at the table and finish your meal, the good kids can go out and play. And that's your empathy. And that's why you, that's what, and, and you want to rescue things, that's the connection to the, to the rescue pets. And, but it also is what makes you unique and special as a human being and, and the loving, caring nature that you have and wanting to serve others and share things with others. That's what we're doing here. That's why you're here. So, so by understanding the market this way, it's like, wow, we got all those wines out here. Now, another thing that's big time in the way of this, oh, the French always drank dr dry wines and the Americans grew up on Coca-Cola. Excuse me, shenanigans, that is not the truth at all. The national drink of Spain is sangria, not red Rioja wine. Sure. The French always love sweet wines. And these people that are great historians and wine experts don't even know that a hundred years ago, very typically, a French champagne could be 30% sweeter than Coca-Cola is today. And, and, and the experts don't know this anymore. And a lot of wines that we, we base all these assumptions and wine and food pairings on, we think Chardonnay was a dry wine when actually the most celebrated great Chardonnay of France comes from a tiny vineyard called Montrachet. And in great vintages, it was sweet, not dry. And the French could add cassis to, to dry acidic white wine and make a kir. They made cocktails with Dubonnet. They put spices and herbs in wine and made vermouth and sweetened it with, with cane sugar. So, so we just really, really got it on. And wine and food pairing was never, ever a thing in France. It's a modern construct. It's metaphorically based. And then we've created all these metaphors and rationale and pseudoscience to scare the hell out of people with, well, you can't have that with your steak because my connection of a metaphor overriding reality says that that's not okay. So I'm trying to stop that. What else? <laughs> I kind of love what I do. Are you having fun back there? Yeah. yeah. And for the, yeah, yes. Somebody's back there. Mm -hmm. 
So at some point, let's talk about becoming a master of wine, yeah. since you talked about that earlier. So describe the process for that and tell me why it was important to you to do it. So I went in, into the wine business full time. So I, in, in, uh, uh, when I went into retail in Atlanta, Georgia in 1979, I was working for a Chinese family in Atlanta. Uh, I could operate a full th three walk professional uh, Chinese kitchen station which is quite an accomplishment. And um, the family's business wasn't doing well, and I was in a wine shop considering applying for a job as a wine manager, and I filled up a lady's cart with wine, and this guy came over and said, can I help you? And he said, oh, this, this nice young man's been helping me. And I filled up a cart, and he goes, well, I would have given you the same wines. I said, well, I'm actually here to apply for this job. And he said, let's talk. So I got hired at Happy Herman's in Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> and it was gourmet groceries, 50 single bean coffees. This is back you know, in, in the, the late 70s, long before any of this coffee stuff. And, um, and, and so I became the wine manager. And there was a guy, an English guy, who was one of the salesmen, sales managers for one of the distributors, Dan Wright. And, uh, Dan and I got to know each other pretty well, and I had one of my Bibles. This evolved into a big, rare wine business at Happy Herman's, the greatest, oldest vintages. And this and I was just soaking things up, and I would see people's names like Michael Broadbent, M.W. and Serena Sutcliffe and Jancis Robinson. These were like, what's this M.W.? And it turned out Dan Wright had had taken the Master of Wine examination five times and never passed. And I'm like, why? He says, oh, it's impossible, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so I said, how cool is that? So some years later, I was joining the Behringer organization in 1988, and I moved out to Napa. And in that year, they had changed part of the Master of Wine examination that used to be very specific to the laws and regulations and taxation and, and so forth with wine that had been specific to, to the UK wine trade, they, they broke that open to make it international versus local. And this was a movement to invite international candidates to sit the Master of Wine examination. And in 1988, Michael Hillsmith was the first non-UK resident to actually pass. He's a, uh, an Australian winemaker. So I thought, I want to do this. And, and I've been told, you can't. <laughs> so uh, I sent in a letter and a dissertation that was required for consideration. And I got a, a letter back that said, jolly good. And I, I did a, a blind tasting and I uh, failed it, but I was close enough that on the strength of my dissertation, I was accepted to come to London to sit the Master of Wine examination. So I went to my, my bosses at the executive uh, uh, committee at, at Berenger and I said, I want to go to London and go take this examination. They go, seriously, you were accepted to this thing? I said, yeah, isn't that cool? They said, do you think you can pass it? I said, no, I don't have, <laughs> I don't have a chance in hell. And they said, great go do some business over there. So I worked with the export group. I started to work with our distributor over there and I entered the program and I sat the examination and I failed it so epically. And I, this is God's honest truth. The, the executive director or the chairman of the Institute used to introduce me for years. And now we'd like to present Mr. Tim Hanai, who along with Joel Butler were the first two Americans to pass the Master of Wine exam. And frankly, he did so poorly on his first attempt, I, had, I found myself with pen and paper in hand trying to find a polite way to say, Mr. Hanai, please stay away for a very long time. <laughs> Seriously. So then I took my engineering course. I was taught critical thinking. And if I hadn't taken, signed up for the wrong course and, and gone through it, I never would have passed the examination. I was taught critical thinking. So don't, don't, jump into an opinion, listen to other points of view, learn to understand. And this, this gave me the ability to actually 
show how much understanding I had of viticulture and fermentation sciences, and here's one way of doing it, but here's another different way and, and whatever. So the pass rate on the Master of Wine examination is less than 8%. And, um, and I went back in 1990, and I wrote my papers. I thought I had failed it, and I got my notice back. Actually, Joel had to, to, to find me and said, we passed, buddy. I go, <laughs> get out of here. You're kidding me. And it was, just so, it was just such a huge accomplishment. And immediately after that, I went through one of the darkest depressions of my life. I was getting divorced. I had this new critical thinking capacity that didn't stop. And I was really looking at, I'm the guru of wine and food pairing, but this doesn't line up with what I know about history. This isn't what they did. This is what wine was even like. And we say to do this because of that. I was doing a lot of, of culinary and wine and wine and food pairing teaching at Behringer. And I sat down with, with my next group of chefs and, and, and experts, and I said, we're starting from scratch here. I don't know what's going on, but I, I really, I'm curious and I wanna find out. And so this went on for a number of years, and then my, my biggest mistake, I started to work with scientists outside of wine to get answers to questions that just get sort of tossed around in wine, but I knew was really biased, was really like, if you're a sweet wine drinker, you're immature, it's just a beginner. Mm -hmm. So I also had a new girlfriend. She was the singer in the rock Motown band I played with. And after practice, I invited her over for a hot tub. And I lived on Manly Lane in <laughs> Rutherford, California. <laughs> and she never left. And we're married today. When she went to take me up to meet mom in Eureka, California, she was a little bit flummoxed and uneasy. And I said, what's, what's up? She said, well, I'm, I want you to meet my mom. But she's a white Zinfandel drinker. <laughs> I said, what's the problem? I work for Behringer. I get it free. <laughs> <laughs> and Wine people have a stereotype of who white Zinfandel drink and who you are. And this ought to really tick you off. And I want you to, to be one of the people out fighting this battle with me, seriously. Her mom is a PhD in economics who is teaching at university level, who was a, on, on a semi-professional golf national circuit, mm -hmm who was actually in her youth, who was a professional fastball, fast, fast Pitch. softball pitcher. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen those people? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're so cool. She's a millionaire, and she loves white Zinfandel. And something didn't match up. So I applied my critical thinking skills, and I started to investigate what don't we know about her? Why do we think she's white trash because this, or she's unsophisticated or uneducated? And so that launched me into this sort of new realm of investigation, and she was, she's the poster child, and, and she's your brethren too. The wines you love, she would love, and, and she's, she doesn't have the aspirations you do, so you're neurologically gonna find your way and, and like, start liking drier wine, especially when you do the salt lemon trick. Mm -hmm. But she's just satisfied as a beverage, just like wine was for centuries. Not what we're doing, none of what we're doing today and the wines we're making today have no basis of comparison to how wines were in the past. Pinot Noir, Cabernet, or whatever. And so, anyways, what was the question? <laughs> Thoroughly answered. Thoroughly Good. Answered. Okay. So let's talk about your writing as well, because you've written a couple of books, including Why You Like the Wines You Like. Yes. So tell us about kind of what inspired you to write. Um, I can't, and I didn't write them. Ah. Um, I'm dyslexic. I'm ADHD. I'm a conflicted, hypersensitive vino type. Uh, if I write you an email, I'll say, Rich, great meeting you. Can't wait to see you again. Come have dinner and bend. I'll then have to go through every other word to, 
to fix this building <laughs> and whatever. I met a, a woman by the name of Virginia Udermolen a number of years ago. She's a, a pediatrician, board certified pe pediatrician. And she studies perception, sensitivities, genetics, and children, learning abilities and disabilities, cognitive processing, uh, personality traits. So this is your Again, going back to what we were just talking about, you and your empathy and whatever. Uh, and I saw this work she was doing and I went, holy moly, this is exactly, it's, it's literally what I was just sort of stumbling on and learning about how many taste buds people have, these perception, huge differences in perception. So I called her and we talked and like I say, yesterday we talked for two hours just on one, you know, thing that science doesn't know. There's no known answer to it and a lot of speculation and a lot of research. Not in wine because we don't do that. We, we're too busy telling people they're stupid. Um, so, so she and I started working and actually collaborating. I've been doing uh, survey and research work sin formally since 1999 on this. So what's that, 18 years now. We've got tens of thousands of survey responses and different, different stages of this research that we've been going through where uh, we actually paint your tongue blue with food color and put a magnifying glass in a camera. We can count your taste buds. We give you certain discrimination and sensitivity testing things and, and that we put all this together. So it, it was, um, uh, we took all of the 25,000 plus survey responses. We took live interviews and in something called the Consumer Wine Awards that was for many years a live test kitchen and, and uh, 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 taking our, our, our different hypotheses and, uh, and, and putting them into action about preferences and, and whatever. And we put together a study that we um, published in 2010 and it was called uh, con Wine Consumer uh, Preferences, Behaviors, and Attitudes Study. It's 54 pages for anybody who wants it, email me and, uh, and I can send, send out a copy. So we published that. In 2011, I was at an industry event in San Francisco and it was big people in the wine industry and all, it was only big bottles of wine and big Riedel glasses. So, and the wines all received big scores. And, um, and I was there with a friend and I, and I, and I love these kind of things also and I love to actually just watch people. And an old friend of mine came up, he's from Memphis and his name's Harvey Posert. He just passed away about three years ago. Harvey, uh, was director, senior vice president of communications and public relationship for Mondavi for 15 years. Uh, prior to that, he was 25 years with the California Wine Institute. And, and it literally could be say, he, he is the man who made the Napa Valley what it is and, and the Mondavi winery what it is. And so here I am at this tasting and here comes Harvey and, and while he was we, we, well, I was director of communications for Behringer during this period, and we'd become very close friends. And he comes chugging up to me. Now, he doesn't have a big glass filled with a big red wine. He's got a cocktail. And he comes up, and I get to do my Harvey invitation. Hey, Hannah, I read that report you published with the doctor at Cornell, and it changed my life. I said, Great, Harvey. In a good way or a bad way? <laughs> he said, in a good way. I'm one of, one of these things you call a sweet vino type, but it, it appears. I said, well, what you drinking? He goes, bourbon, my way. <laughs> and I said, got it. He says, we need to talk because you need to write a book. I said, I can't write a book. I can't read a book, Harvey. <laughs> I'm serious, and I'm serious about this. I don't read a book a year. I said, I'd love to. He says, well, we can find a solution to that. And I said, well, 
what, so, so you're a sweet vino type. He said, when Bob Mondavi hired me, I said, Bob, I can't stand your wines. They taste like crap. <laughs> and Bob said, Harvey, I'm not hiring you to drink my wine. I'm hiring you to make us famous. And I said, okay, I can do that. <laughs> and, and we have no clue how many millions and millions of people feel so disenfranchised and embarrassed and that's probably what you feel. Oh, how come I don't get it? How come I don't like the Cabernets? How, you know, blah, blah. And it's this chatter. And it's the same thing you were feeling when, when you were getting punished. So quit putting so much salt on your food. And why can't you be like the other kids? You sit at the table and, and everybody else can go play. The good kids can go play. You stay there until you finish your meal. We punish people for living in the sensory world. We don't get it. And that's why your empathy, by the way, that's why you really, really want to love people and why you love it back. And I'm one too, so I'm with you, bro. <laughs> All right, so here's Harvey going through this. So he hooked me up with Sasha Paulson. Sasha was the, uh, the features and wine editor for the Napa Valley Register and just absolute most wonderful woman in the world. And so uh, we collaborated. I puked stuff out of my head. She organized it all and we wrote the book, and so it was published in January of 2012. Why you like the wines you like, changing the way the world thinks about wine. And what was the reception? It's been great. It's really been great, and it's really causing a lot of controversy. Um, I get attacked by so many people who, who refuse to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> have no idea what the premise is, have no idea about the, and even to this day. So um, it's, uh, I ran into, I had heard about this with my electrical engineering seminar I went to, it's called uh, disruption. And there's something called constructive disruption. And that's where you, f where you find a paradigm and you use critical thinking and you break it down and then you create a new product, a new price or something that when it, when it comes into uh, the market or into thinking or whatever, um, people can't not do it. So I'm, I'm kind of, I'm over the hump in my disruption and, and it's gaining a lot of, of um, uh, uh, New Zealand. Uh, do you ever watch CNN? You know, they did the piece on Jeremiah Tower. Uh, it, was, it aired last night. Okay. It was the last magnificent and it's the, the history of the greatest chef in the United States that you've never heard of. And he, he was um, credited with creating California cuisine. He literally changed the, the, the face of cuisine globally. And, um, but then ran into all sorts of business stuff and all sorts of, of stuff, whatever. He's one of the greatest promoters of what I do. And now he's back in the limelight. And when people say, well, no chef would ever do this. Yeah, yeah they will. Some of the most famous chefs in the world do what I promote in principles of wine and food and respecting personal preferences and opinions. And so I've got a three-star Michelin chef. I just did a four-hour workshop with the chefs and the senior educators at Mondavi. Bob Mondavi was a huge fan of all this work. So disruption occurs uh, in computing. It used to be if you wanted to compute, you were forced to learn a language. You were a forced to understand code. It, it was for, you either did it because you loved that, which was a teeny tiny percent of the market, or because you had to do it and hated it because it was now part of a job. In computing, they looked at the user interface for the first time and said, you know what, we've got enough technology here if you want to open a file, instead of hitting C forward slash forward slash semicolon, blah, 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 we'll make a little picture and you go, click, click, look me, I'm computing, I open the file. And there's the file names, not some code and, and whatever that you're forced to learn to say, I want to do this. So they invented the graphic user interface that changed computing forever. 
And there were people who resisted it. The people who knew the code, much like our sommeliers and our experts today, you know the language, you know wine and food pairing. It's all a bunch of code, it's all a bunch of metaphors, it's all a bunch of crap. And so what I'm trying to install is a graphic user interface that we can interface with consumers and say, hey, let's do wine on your terms and I'm expert so I can be your guide. I'm not going to dictate how you're going to do it. I'm going to help you explore on your terms. And it just changes the game. So there are still people that are griping and me, 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 but the, the data's there, the experience is there. At Mondavi, we went through, well, but the fat in the steak helps to make the tannin softer. Cook a steak, no salt, no seasoning, grill it, try your red wine, try the fat, try the red wine, it gets more bitter, more sour. It's actually the opposite of what the experts are telling you it should do. The proteins in the steak and amino acids that give it flavor, you've heard of umami taste? I introduce that word into our consciousness. It's a very old term and it's probably the most ancient and important uh, uh, taste sensation humans can discern. And I was talking about it 30 years ago because I was working in, with scientists not involved with wine but, but at a much higher plane of learning. And they're all talking about this primary taste of deliciousness. It's glutamate and nucleotides. It makes food taste good. Humans crave it. And if it's a lot of it in your food, it makes your wine suck. And so this whole, even something is, is seemingly basic and immutable is red wine with red meat has absolutely no basis. It's the salt you put on the steak that suppresses the bitterness. When you do your tequila trick, Tim's tequila trick, red wine, lick in, wow, that's awesome. That's what happens. And so people in the wine industry have stopped thinking and they just entrench on their personal opinion and argue and it's like, it's like the uh, Sufi parable about the, the three blind men and the elephant. I, I, it's a snake and, and they're feeling the tail. It, it's, that's, that's what it is. But the, the guy that's feeling the leg, no, it's a tree trunk. No, it's, you know, and we don't know it. And this is, this is such an area of robust scientific understanding and investigation. And the wine industry just blah, blah, blah. Oh, the cherries and the olala berries. And do you get the essence of hunkleberry? <laughs> and we're just all in our head and we don't know it. So what was your question? <laughs> Who even remembers? Who knows? <laughs> Maybe I answered it. If not, email me. <laughs> So you've talked about this a little bit, but I'm curious why wine history is important. Why is the wine industry? Why, why history, wine history is important. Oh, it's not. Okay. It actually doesn't have a dang thing to do with your enjoyment. Uh, why it's important to me is because I'm curious. But why I think it's important for the future, I don't think you need to know anything about it unless you're curious. And then if you give me permission and you say, you know, I'd like to know a little bit more. I can dazzle you with stories and, and trivia and, and I can go back into ancient cookbooks and show you that wine and food wasn't done and that wines were totally different than what we think and that sweet wines were always prized and valued in France and whatever. So I can use history as a validation for necessitating change in our education process. So that's why it's, one, I found it just, I was bedazzled. I mean, in sitting in a library, I love libraries, and I don't read books, but I open them up, and I love to glean things. Somehow, the way my wine, mind works is I can take this concept of, of sensory sciences and take this little snippet from history and tradition and then take this from anthropology or psychology and say, huh, did we ever think maybe? And that's what I do. So I'm the moron in the middle that can't write an email without <laughs> having to go back and revise half of it. But there's some really cool things for us all to learn. And, and one of the other things, and, you know, I hadn't even thought about it, but it might be because I can't write a word and I have to go back. I think about words a lot. So um, 
I pay a lot of attention to how we use words in wine. So you've been told most of taste is really smell, something like that. It's not. It's like saying most of those books is the shelves. Is it? No. They're independent, but they're interdependent. Actually, when you have a cold, you're a better taster. And uh, next time you get a chance, hold your nose, a little cinnamon. You'll taste everything, and you'll actually pay more attention to the taste, because taste is independent of smell. Let your nose go, oh, wow. Now, taste a seasoned salt, like Lowry's or even a spicy Lowry's that has the hot burning trigeminal touch end of things. Do that, put it in your mouth. Oh, well, it's salty, it's bitter, there's a little sweetness, and then the burning of, which isn't a taste, that's a chemical irritation of touch nerve endings called chemesthetic reaction. And oh, that's very cool. So, so even the simplest of things that are, are really well known in sensory sciences and whatever are totally muddled in wine. We, we overcomplicate. The word terroir, you've heard terroir. Jesus, give me a break. It doesn't come from the word soil. It comes from the word land. And so all it means is territory. It means of the land, not of the soil. Like this land is your land or land of Oz. We're going to the land of Oz. They're not going to the soil of Oz. And, and so ter you know, this is a terroir-driven wine. Pfft, that's like saying nothing. And there's all this argument about the, how the soil imparts this. And, and it's just all poppycock. It's the people. It's the culture. It's the economies. It's the traditions. It's the climate. It is the soil. But that's such a minor part of it all. You know, and so we tend to take the simplest things like taste and smell, collapse them together, and that renders us incapable of communicating. Do you remember the story of the Tower of Babel? All right, and so those humans decided to aspire to the gods, and gods rend them, rendered them incapable of communicating. And so Enobabel from the Greek enos, wine, babble, meaning to uh, talk in an uh, incomprehensible manner. And that's what we're teaching people to do. In the wine industry, again, no, the terroir driven this and that. It's actually, and then, oh, well, you can't really explain terroir. Yes, you can, I'm sorry, but you're just too lazy to actually look at the etymology, understand that a goût de terre was not the taste of the earth. It was an earthy taste. It was like soil, like soiled, like soiled diapers. And, and actually, in French sensory science vernacular, goût de terre is a term indicating microbiological spoilage, not the taste of earth, an earthy taste, and not good earth, like fresh compost. That's not even compost, it smells like poop. It's <laughs> so we just obfuscate this, we, we talk past each other, we have these endless, ridiculous conversations, and consumers, hey, can I have a glass of milk? No, you're too stupid. We're, we're busy with important stuff. And we're just morons. What was the question? <laughs> so why does it continue then? Why, why is the industry so entrenched in that way of thinking? So that led to, <laughs> these are the doors. Sure. All right, there's a social phenomenon called collective delusions. All right. A collective delusion is something that's commonly held, but patently untrue. And, there's, and, the, and everybody reacts to words. Words are only metaphors. They're representational. Oh, a delusion. Oh, this isn't a delusion. Collective delusions keep things running. They're common. There's nothing wrong with them. And we're getting ready to celebrate one of the biggest collective delusions in the Western world. And it happens on December 25th. What is going to happen? And what's the story we tell? Christmas and the birth of Jesus. Birth of Jesus. Right. And and what's what are we telling the children's going to happen on Christmas Eve? Santa Claus is going to drop presents down our chimney. Santa Germany. Claus. Yeah. Got it. Now I I don't want to be a spoiler. Spoiler alert. You know there's not a Santa Claus. Okay, good. 
good. Didn't want to screw that up. I already did that for my kids. But we tell the story. Where did that story come from and why? It was actually to control children during the long winter periods in Scandinavia. And you better be good. You won't get the present. You'll get cold. The good kids, oh, don't do that. And all it was was crowd control for kids. And it's perpetuated. It grew. It got commercialized. It became economically a bonanza. And the story is told over and over again, though we know it's implausible. And finally, kids start growing up and say, hey, hey, dad, come here, let's talk. Look at our chimney. Look at this picture of Santa Claus. <laughs> Get straight with me here. Oh, well, maybe you're of age that I can tell you we're lying to you. <laughs> we know it's not true. It's fertilizer. We do that. OK. Uh, uh, the agree it's an agreement to stop at a red light or a stop sign. It's a delusion. We've created consequences. It's used to give order to things. It's a very valuable delusion, but it, you don't have to stop. And sometimes not all of us do stop. We may sort of stop. So whenever there's a collective delusion, there's also a consequence for not buying into it. So if you don't grow up to like dry red wines, you're immature, you're unsophisticated, and you can't be part of the in crowd. Wine and food matching is important, and we've got all this hyper, oh, it'll ruin, it could ruin your life. And people li literally write like, oh, asparagus and red wine. Those same people will say, but oh, wine and food grow up together, and there's this natural harmony, blue, blue, blue. Well, one of the most classic accompaniments to anything a la Bordelaise, Bordeaux, France, where they make Merlot-based and Cabernet and a lot of dry red wines and a lot of sweet white wines and a lot of dry white wines, a lot of rosé wines and all sorts of wines. One of the most common garnishes is asparagus. And nobody says, oh, we're not drinking wine. We've got to, that's stupid. 90% of the people that have asparagus and wine, it's never a problem. Now, for you, you're hypersensitive. You'll need the lemon and the salt, which we do anyways. As a matter of fact, if you're a trained chef, you. You, you parboil, you blanch in salted, acidulated, and that helps to reduce the reaction of the natural glutamate that's the umami taste that causes the negative sensory reaction like brushing teeth, drinking orange juice. It doesn't happen for 90% of people, and if it does, a little lemon juice, hollandaise sauce or something on it, a little balsamic, and, and par, you know, problem solved. Don't tell people you got to have a Sauvignon Blanc because Sauvignon Blanc has 2-methoxy-3-isobutyl-pyrazine, which is shared by grass is why it smells grassy and vegetable, and uh, that's why it pairs together, because it doesn't. It actually makes that worse, and if you don't like it, it sucks even more. So we've just got all this cockamamie stuff going around. Okay. <laughs> Greg's learning, don't introduce me to anybody. I <laughs> Make sure you have some time. Yeah. Some time. Yeah. Here's Tim. I'm going to walk away for about 20 minutes. I'll be back. <laughs> so I'm curious. We are the Oregon Wine History Archive, obviously. So yes. we like to ask everybody about Oregon specifically. So I'm yes. curious your thoughts on Oregon wine. And any, you can take that any way you want to take it. Um, I love Oregon wines. I actually, when I was a retailer in Atlanta, I was the first to introduce uh, 1978 so-called Bloss or Pinot Noir, I think their, their first vintage, Yamhill County. It would have been very early, yeah. 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 And so I was an early adopter and loved it. I love it. I love wine from Indiana. I love wine from Turkey. Ask me where I'm going in December. Where are you going in December, Tim? I'm going to Tonghua, China. That's for, for wine? For why? Why are you going there? Yes. Wait, no, ask where is it? Where is it? 50 miles north of the North Korea border. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> a bundle up, buddy. It's a, a, a really, really small town. Literally, it's less than a million people, 600,000, which is tiny. And, um, and they specialize in ice wine. And they make these really wonderful sweet wines. 
that we call dessert wines. You've heard everybody, everybody should remove the word dessert wine from every wine you make. It's a misnomer. It was created by the U.S. feds to close a tax loophole after prohibition in all those wines that are sweet in even the great Chateau Achem and Port and whatever in France were revered, they were expensive, and they were drunk before and with the meal. And interesting, you will rarely ever find any evidence of them being served after the meal. And they're for you, because you love those wines. And you'll love them with roast beef. And people used to drink oysters in Chateau Achem that's this really, really sweet wine. So they're sweet wines, not dessert wines. They don't go at the end of the meal. They go for people who like sweet wine. Hate sweet wines? Don't drink it. That's fine. Or have it with dessert. That's fine. But why move it to the end of the meal in the most guilt-ridden category instead of celebrating it like it used to be? So anyways, we just sort of cut ourselves off. So here's what you need to know, Oregon. This, I'm going to speak directly to them for just a second. Please. Don't screw it up. We moved to Bend because Napa is insufferable with concierge this, with $200 bottles of that, with, oh yes, we can fit you in for a four o'clock. We've curated wines to go and we're going to give a pairing demonstration and it's $200 a person if you want to go. Don't screw it up. This place is beautiful. This is like coming back to the Napa I loved in 1980 and it's totally gone. It's totally gone in Napa. The wines are boring. Everybody, oh, my terroir-driven Cabernet Sauvignon aged in new French oak that got 95 points from Parker. That's great. You and about 500 other freaking people in the same area. It's not unique. It's not anything sensational. And don't get caught up in your own Pinot Noir crap so that you come up with a monoculture. There are many styles, there are many ways to celebrate Pinot Noir, and there are other varieties and so on. We're stifling ourselves, we're stifling creativity in the wine industry, and it'll also cause, have a negative impact on tourism, on hospitality and what you're able to offer, because you're gonna go from one winery to the next, they'll taste more and more the same every year because people are all doing the same practices, learning from you. So you'll become the most boring place in the world for Pinot Noir unless you get smart and, and, and get. There's, there's a diversity of consumers out there that's so rich and so diversified and you're not catering to them. So, so my advice to the Oregon wine industry is first and foremost, respect, learn more about consumers, offer true hospitality and don't get so caught up in yourself that, that a, a five acre parcel of land goes for a million dollars obviating now everybody's got to strive for that and the prices go up and, and, you, and you're, you know what you're going to end up with you guys? I'm not talking to you back there, I'm talking to them. You're going to end up what's going on in Tuscany. I just heard this at a conference and I loved it. Napa Valley and Tuscany are filled with permanent tourists, not locals. The locals are gone. They can't afford to be there. It's the new people who move in that now own it, that come with their money. They build their mansions. They revitalize the, the old places, which is a good thing, but they make it so expensive and so unapproachable all in this lavish thing. It might be what you're into, but I'm sorry. I'm not, and I don't think 90% or 95% of consumers are. So don't get caught up on it. See if you can actually maintain what is so extraordinary about Oregon, and that's the people, that's the diversity, that's the Marion Berries, it's the hops, it's the, the craft breweries. I was, I was just over at one of the craft brewers, I won't name it for a commercial, but dang it, they're, they're co for fermenting beer and Viognier. They had a Brett beer. They're taking one of the, the most undesirable bacteriological contaminations in wine and they're actually celebrating it. And they've got this Guayacol 4-ethylphenol filled explosion of flavor that most people will hate, but some of us will go, this is so cool. What are you guys thinking? And they were just getting ready to put 200 pounds of cranberry 
into a co-ferment, and, and they were trying to find the way that they could break it down cellularly. They were froze it so they can mush it and break open the cells and the flavor. <coughs> That's cool. Wine industry is becoming more and more boring, and as you become more successful, so will your wines. Don't do it. So if someone asks you, or someone tells you, I've never had wine before, but I want to try it, what do you say to them? No. No. <laughs> it would save a lot of headache. Yeah, it really would. Say, don't, don't bother. <laughs> How old are you and you've never tried wine? Um, I'll ask questions like I asked you before. Uh, how do you take your coffee? How, uh, how much do you like or dislike salt? What happens when you have artificial sweeteners? These things. And, and, and the answers, by the way, a lot of people think they know what these questions correlate to, and they're usually absolutely way off, all right? Because again, we think it, people who dump salt on their foods, it's a sign of no taste buds, and it's the number one sign of the most taste buds, all right? Total back ass words correlation, so there's a lot to learn about this process. Then, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna say, here's a glass of Pinot Gris, try it. How do you like that? And I can watch their face and I know. Don't trust what they're saying, because if they're asking you, you'll say, oh yeah, it's interesting, and you'll be lying, right? If I've got a sweet wine, I'll say, let's try this. If I don't, I'll get some marionberry syrup or some cassis and do what they did in France, pour that a little bit in, try that. Oh, that's really, and you would go, oh, that's really good, yeah. But people are embarrassed to do that because we've been, our attitudes and whatever. So if, if that's the direction we're going, I say, well, I don't have anything for you, but thank you for visiting. Now, if you want, you could buy some Pinot Gris and some of this Marionberry syrup. <laughs> but you know, winemakers, <gasps> that's an affront to the terroir-driven wine that we've crafted and whatever. That was never what it was in France. That's a bunch of fertilizer. Okay, I haven't hardly cussed once, have I? Very impressive. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, uh, now if they say, okay, you know, that's okay, but I think, you know, I'd like something, I, I like something a little more intense or, or whatever, oh great. So let's, let's start in that direction. So here's a, a reserve uh, Pinot Grigio with some oak, or here's a Chardonnay, or here's a Pinot Noir. You wanna try a red? Oh, let's try a red. Great, let's try that. What do you think? Oh, that's nice, awesome. Let's continue to play there, or eh, not so much. Oh, let's do the tequila trick. And I'm gonna show you when you have red wine, and they'll do that, and they'll go, wow. They literally do this with friends. It, you, you'll go wow, even though, I want you to say, I won't go wow, I won't go wow, and you'll go wow. Um, and, then I, and then I'll play. And then we'll, we'll see if we can find, find a spot for them that, that, that they feel comfortable. And say, okay, so, uh, buy a lot of this from my winery <laughs> and or at the restaurant you know order a bottle of this or at the retail store come back to me I'll always be your best friend I'll always be dedicated to what you like and then if you feel like exploring we'll do it in graduations we're not going to thrust you into this because you're having a steak or this or that so feel confident that the wines you love are great with the food you eat if it's Gets a little funky, a little squeeze of lemon, the slightest titch of salt, problem solved. And um, yeah, and then only do business with people like me. Find a retailer in your market that you trust, that's in, more interested in you than this stuff we do about wine. So that's what I would do. Okay. Do you have any current or future projects you're excited about? Do, always. <laughs> it's crazy. I, I figured. So right now what we're actually looking for are correlations and um, uh, we're, uh, we just had a proof of concept of venotypes at Michigan State University School of Hospitality and it validated and their conclusion was that used in hospitality and restaurants this would be huge. Um, uh, the, the projects that we're, we're currently uh, engaged in, in the consumer end, is looking at the very specific genetic variations and specific SNPs responsible for perception and the variations of perception. So uh, for alcohol burn, uh, you've got people, really great experts like Dan Berger, 
Wines are way too much alcohol. They're horrible. They're horrible with food. They're discussing how you're stupid if you like them and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but then you've got somebody like Robert Parker who 16% alcohol, tons of extract and intensity. So there's a known genetic variation um, and it's I think the TRPV1 uh, 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 collection and uh, the three, the three SNP variations, if you don't have a, the specific SNP for alcohol warming, um, uh, alcohol is sweet. You don't get the burning from scotch or anything. And the scotch actually tastes sweet, which you cannot even imagine because you're at Dan Berger's end of things. So, uh, and this is, this is a known variant, and, um, and I can't remember if it comes up in your 23andMe results in, in the detail if you get the $200 test, but it is it does come up in the, the master database of, of your SNPs. Uh, uh, then there's a one SNP variant, and if you've got one SNP, alcohol burns, um, it's tolerable, and you can even learn to like something. So when you learn to like, or it, it's actually a neuro, your palate's not changing, it's, it's actually your, your neural plasticity, it's called. You're attaching aspiration or, or something, um, a, a valuation that's now a positive response to stimulus rather than your intuitive response, which is not like it. All right, so that's how you acquire a taste. And the opposite for how you dispose of a taste. Quit eating sugar, it's for kids. And what, you've got to learn to not like sweet. All humans like sweet, and it's totally unnatural to go, oh, I don't like sweet wines. We call that the sommelier sneer. <laughs> All right, so, um, so if you've got one snip, that's, that's sort of uh, uh, a warming and a, a certain degree of tolerance. If you've got two snips, eh, eh, eh. It's Dan Berger. It's actually my research colleague who's a board certified pediatrician who speaks four languages impeccably. He's one of the most brilliant people, human beings you'll ever meet in your lifetime. And if the wine's more than about 11% alcohol and less than 3% residual sugar, so we're talking white Zin and Moscato, she cannot stand it. It burns, it hurts. It's also my friend Harvey Posert, who was one of the giants of the wine industry, and his dirty secret was he had two genetic SNPs for alcohol warming. So this really solves a lot of problems is, is understanding this. Now, uh, this is a small percentage people, but you're in the group most likely. Do you, know, do you or someone you know hate cilantro? Mm -hmm. Is it you or someone you know? Got it. I love it. So there's a cilantro SNP. And if you have it, it's only about 4% of Caucasians, 17% of, of Jews and people from Azerbaijan. Are you good at geology? Azerbaijan? I, I, it's 70% of people ethnically from there, but only 4% of overall Caucasians. And if you've got the gene, it's this horrible, soapy, disgusting. You will never acquire a taste for it because it is so disgusting. Oh, but I used to not like bitter, and I used to not like cilantro, so you should learn to like it too. Julia Child had the snip. She never learned to like it, so is she unsophisticated? She was on Larry King Live, and she was asked, is there any food you can't eat? She says, I hate cilantro. It's disgusting. And he said, well, what do you do if you encounter it in food? She says, I pick it out or spit it out, and I throw it on the floor. And if it's in the food, it's ruined the dish. I can't even eat it. So, so, and we just don't get this, you know? We don't get that people are perceiving, we don't, it's just like color blindness or, you know, if people have autism, they're in this whole different sensitivity spectrum and sound is so loud and chaotic that they have to wear earmuffs for certain variations of it. That's all, we're just different. So that's what we're looking at now. What are these specific genetic drivers. And then the other thing that, that, that I love and I'm passionate about is I teach wine business. And that's a class I'm going to go teach online here in about 55 minutes. All around, I've got a student in Iceland. I've got somebody in Galway, Ireland. And they'll all be attending Linfield College today. So I've been doing this for seven years. And I design uh, wine financial software to make learning about the business of wine kind of like playing Farmville. 
And it's really, really cool. You, well, what if I did this? Ka-ching, ka-ching. You see how much money you lose, see what it does to the price of your wine, try to sort it all out. That's pretty cool. So those, those are the big things. And then evangelizing. I, I'm really, really, my mission is to change the way the wine industry thinks in a positive way, in a disruptive way, so that we, we don't, we don't stand for people saying, oh, well, as your palate matures, I'm sorry, let me correct you. You may have been taught that, but that's patently untrue. Well, sweet wine, blah, 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 time out, time out. So we've got this idea that we have to educate wine consumers. That's a kiss of death for marketing. We need to become better educated to serve consumers. And the, the information that we're, we're working on is not correct. It's not good information. If there's a, you guys got a wine section in here? I can go through and show you mistake after mistake after mistake in history and science and wine and food pairing. And it's scaring the hell out of consumers. It's not going to get us. And it's going to get the Oregon wine industry into a monoculture of boring wines filled with really rich people. And all the, the locals will be gone because they can't afford to live here anymore or don't want to. I could afford to live in Napa, but I don't want to. I want to live in Oregon. Well, obviously, yeah. Yeah. That's all the questions I have. That's it? Shockingly. Come on. Is there anything else that I did not ask that I should have or anything else you know, you'd like to say? Yeah, I'd like to, I'd, I'd actually like to say something because something, I, things bring me back to what's really important in life. And it's not an argument over which wine should be rated this way or even which rating system is best. I, one of my best friends in the world passed away last night, Jeff Booth. He was a sweet vino type winemaker. He pioneered, he was a winemaker for Pine Ridge Winery and introduced a Chenin Blanc Viognier blend that was specifically a passion of his because of his sensitivities. He was a champion of the Chenin Blanc grape that's gone into obscurity. It's one of the great grapes of the world, but it's for hypersensitive and sweet vino types, and it doesn't meet today's standards and criteria. And all of this wine crap just falls away when it comes to the people who are important in our life and our family and around the world. And that's, what's, that's what wine was. We, we falsely say, oh, it's about community and people, and we're not. We're not hospitable anymore. We don't connect. We, we push people away. We use wine and food like a tool. We teach sommeliers to, to serve wine like serving a greater God, not to serve the people. And we mock them and we make fun of them and we have no clue about the history and the traditions. So I, I would really like to say I've got a passion, I've got a love of wine like nobody you can imagine but it's always focused on how can I use my expertise to make your life richer, to bring more people and more joy to the table, and to better serve the people, not to serve this false god of wine. So, voila. That's good closing words. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time and your wisdom.